I'm, I'm standing in for Peter Manji today, who sends his regrets. For those of you who are regulars at this series, Peter organizes our speaker series and would normally be standing here, but he's out of town. And it's actually a, a serendipitous uh, opportunity for me to be able to play this role because I, I thought I would bring a, a piece of, of old technology uh, artifact from the past. This is a book entitled Communications Technology and Social Policy, which is actually the papers from a very large conference that was held in 1972. The book was edited by George Gerbner, Larry Gross, and William Melody. <laughs> so I thought I would bring Bill a blast from his past. <laughs> Still uh, the definitive piece of the, the, the is, Well, in some, in some parts of this book, the, the articles are more artifactual than others. There are articles on things like uh, Trends in Switch Services, <laughs> circa 1972. Uh, communicating with the man on the moon. Uh, communication satellites, then sort of new and, and things like uh, FCC rules in the public interest, when they, back when they used to have one. Uh, <laughs> Dick Johnson on the Fairness Doctrine. And the role of advocacy in public policy planning by a William Mellon. <laughs> It's a really distinct pleasure for me to be able to introduce a former colleague from um, another time and another place, but someone who remains, to me, one of the most interesting and informative voices in this whole area of telecommunications policy. And I'm really delighted to have him here with us today. And I will turn this over to Jonathan, as this is a, an Arnic-sponsored uh, co-sponsored talk within our series. Gentlemen. Um, oh, by the way, Peter would be. Uh, <coughs> Peter, are you doing <laughs> <laughs> Next week's. Oh, the end? <laughs> well, I'm going to do it now because I may forget at the end of it. <laughs> Next week's is the. Uh, in this series, let me see if this is supposed to talk. Is this supposed to talk about anybody? No, Doesn't seem to be. Paul Leonardi from Northwestern University uh, will speak on. Turning Technology into a Resource for Structuring, a Comparative Study of Materiality and Network Change. I'm delighted that uh, Melody has uh, joined us today. Uh, I said, which part of your vast uh, resume do you want me to highlight, since I believe the short uh, introduction to me? Said so well. Obviously, I taught at Penn with this guy Gross. Um, I he has uh, taught and been active uh, in many things, including as the editor of Telecommunications Policy for a period. Uh, he now teaches uh, in Denmark uh, at the LSE uh, and in South Africa all at the same time as a visiting professor, which to quote uh, him means that, that means he's retired <laughs> <laughs> from this. Uh, but for someone who has quote unquote retired, he's more active than almost anybody I know uh, and continues to, uh, as the founder and the, the, a moving force behind the Learn Network, which he may let, I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about uh, to, be, to deal with that. Uh, I'd also like to sort of briefly uh, welcome, we have a couple of visitors from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia here, uh, who have, uh, are here and would be, uh, be happy to talk to people if there's interest. Um, Andrei uh, Tarakov uh, is the head of the math and computer science department and works with the software technology uh, in, uh, at the, at in Russia, and Stanislav Kachenko is a professor of international relations, also at St. Petersburg State University. And some of you know my other hat in international relations, Stanislav and I are old friends, and Andre is a new friend. So anybody 
who wants uh, to know what's really happening in high technology in Russia, grab them <laughs> right after the meeting. But uh, now I turn to Bill um, and his talk for today, which is entitled Shaping the New Knowledge Economy, the Uncertain Search for Policy and Regulatory Foundation. Which, uh, Chris said, you know, given the speech about financial regulation this morning uh, from the president, you know, there's an air of, this is, we, we may be sort of departing from our theoretical roots and this may actually have some relevance. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. It's uh, very nice to be here again. For your information, I come to the Annenberg School every time there's a regime change. <laughs> Uh, and this is my first visit during this current regime. Uh, and it's very nice to have a sellout audience, but being a realist and seeing people standing at the back, I would like everyone to raise their hands who are here only for the lunch. <laughs> because you can leave and then the rest can sit down. Don't be modest. This is the age of candor, <laughs> but your professors won't let you leave. Uh, we have some chairs here. Why don't you people at the back come and take them? Come on, Jackie. Uh, you sit at the table, too. The penalty is you have to stay to, stay to the end. <laughs> but I believe the end is determined by time, right? Not yes. by me. So, okay. Uh, perhaps a few words of introduction about the learning now. Uh, the reason I can be so active when I'm retired is because when you're retired, there are certain things you don't have to worry about anymore. Uh, raising research funds. Uh, being an administrator, hiring people, firing people, uh, that is, and even teaching full courses. That gives you time to do what you want to do. So what I and many other retired professors do is we spend our time being a visiting professor just about everywhere. And we go to the nice places at the nice times to see old colleagues. And it is a true delight to see Larry after I don't know how many years, but it could be a quarter century since we uh, last saw one another. And I was firmly convinced that he was rooted in Philadelphia forever. Uh, but in my retirement years, I have been focusing on de helping developing countries. Basically, trying to bring them into the information age that we now see as developing. And my role as an educator has been working primarily in helping get new centers, new teaching and research centers in the ICT field established in developing countries and linking them to centers in developed countries so that they can learn from each other. The LEARN network basically began with me helping <coughs> developing country universities uh, uh, as those universities develop programs of their own, uh, and uh, they develop their own networks, uh, and the LEARN network now consists of centers in Africa, a Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, uh, and it's had, it is linked to most of the universities where I have been a professor. What I'm very proud of is that I have now retired from that because it, what started out as top-down driven activity has now been diversified out to the regions. So if you want to know what's going on in the Learn Network now, you look more to the regions than you do look to the center. But if you go to the website, that will direct you to all the regional sites and all of their activities, and you can get the details there. Rather than speak to one of the more specific research issues that I'm addressing these days, uh, recognizing the diversity of your interests, I have decided I'm going to talk about how I see the basic overall framework or structure 
uh, in which my more specific research activities fit. I think when you're doing research, one of the things you learn very much in interdisciplinary research uh, is that the interesting challenges tend to come from outside your discipline. You're familiar with the literature in your own discipline, the debates, the arguments, the theories, the methods. It's when someone from outside your discipline. When I went to Penn, someone like Larry Gross would come up and ask me questions that I thought were really weird uh, and totally, them. totally, <laughs> totally irrelevant and unrelated to my work until I found out that basically the, re my, the results of my work really didn't work out the way I thought they would because I hadn't addressed questions that Larry and others outside my profession had raised. So I think what I'm doing today is <coughs> called shaping the new knowledge economy. And by shaping, I mean influencing. Influencing the significant way affecting the course of development, the speed of development, particularly of different parts uh, of the information economy and the factors that affect it. It is driven, I think, significantly by recent growth. I can classify. Turn your phones off. I can classify most of the developments in the telecom reform and ICT convergence processes today essentially as a series of activities that are simply removing old regulations. Right? I could explain just about everything that's happened. It is simply the result of removing old regulations from the industrial era of telecom monopolies. Uh, and we've seen lots of beneficial effects. But my argument has been that sooner or later we have to turn to the new policies and regulations. That is, what is going to underpin the new knowledge economy? And we're now just beginning to turn more seriously to the new policies and regulations. And that's why I argue this is, at this stage, a very uncertain search for policy and regulation foundations. And I think the policy and regulation foundations will be perhaps more fundamental than the traditional beliefs that technology or markets will drive these developments. And what in particular stimulates, I hope, people's attention is the fact that this string of unmitigated benefits that people have seen from the changes so far uh, I think is now broadly recognized as having some negative aspects as well. And of course, the financial collapse is the best illustration. What is the sector in the economy that has applied the ICT revolution sooner, faster, and more pervasively than any other? Finance and banking. And what has been the effect of this instant communication? the instant movement of money. And what has been the effect of the instant movement of money? Substantial uncertainty in the financial markets. Not only stock markets, currency exchange markets. All financial markets are becoming more and more unstable. We often spoke of as casino capitalism. That, interestingly, one of the, the uh, greatest most the highest volume markets in finance these days is the simple foreign exchange market. Would you like to bet on the Danish kroner today? You know, it might go up a bit today and you could make a lot of money. Or it might go down. You know? So not a lot different than uh, going to Vegas and pulling the slot machines. This is where a significant amount of the resources of our financial economy are going. So that pauses us to stop, and governments around the world are now considering, what kinds of policy and regulation will we put on the financial community for the future development of that sector? And that debate is going on now. And as you know, if you follow the press, that there's a great deal of uncertainty about what to do and how to do it and what its implications will be. Well, if banking and finance is the leader in the applications, then what about the other sectors? 
when they come along and go through similar kinds of transformation. So what I want to do is basically just lead you through the basic logic that comes up to the question of what are the major areas of policy and research today that are going to be the areas where the uncertainty will be, the debates will be, uh, and, and there will be a significant uh, amount of uh, vested interest activity in the formulation of these uh, policy, new policies and regulations. Uh, and what I hope my talk will be a stimulus to is a lot of research by you and your colleagues that will inform these developments with some sensible research results from a public interest perspective. So we can bring back some advocacy of the public interest. In my work throughout my career, I have seen public interest research is not only needed to provide <coughs> independent objective research evidence that needs to go into the policy process, but it has to be advocated. Otherwise, it will be very quickly forgotten. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that one of the positive results of the financial crisis is that the public interest is going to be rediscovered. And at least for the Obama ad administration, we have some hope that it might. Okay. I'll turn to the... Uh, you get the aim of yeah, the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. Primary force is shaping the development path. Convenient way to structure this is its technologies, markets, and policy. But technologies, markets, and policies are only, implemented, are, are only effective if there are applications of technologies. That is, if markets are providing services that are actually put into effect and if policies are turned into regulation. So a convenient way to examine issues is to look at the interplay between the developments within the tech with regard to the technologies, with regard to markets, and with regard to policies. Uh, and there is always an interplay. There are forces behind each that are pushing. It's also important to recognize that policies don't necessarily lead to any change. One of the frustrations of my life has been helping governments write policy statements. And they were beautiful policy statements. And they went to some shelf somewhere, and nothing ever happened. Uh, what matters is, what are the regulations that actually come out of this? And of course, we're seeing this so far in Washington with regard to the financial reform. A lot of beautiful policy statements are being made, but there's no effective regulations being established. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Uh, if you think about this division, you will note that if you look at the literature from different professions, you can find they tend to presume that one leads and the others follow. Right? Technological determinism pervades a lot of the literature. <coughs> Basically, change in the world comes when technologies are developed in some magic way, are injected into society, that creates markets, then the, then the policymakers come along and make policy relating to those effects. Uh, that, of course, is wrong. Uh, the, there is also the belief that markets must lead the way. Right? There's no market. What's the point of having the technology or policies? And then, of course, policy and regulation. Uh, that without the policy underpinnings, there can be no markets and technology won't be developed. Well, in fact, it is an ongoing interplay among the three. And one can find occasions where you can say it was basically a new technology, technological development that pushed the others into reacting, and you can find occasions where markets were the initiator and others were policy and regulation of the initiator. In my experience from my early days at the FCC, before most of you were born, uh, that what I found was that the FCC had all kinds of regulations preventing anyone from doing anything except at and <laughs> And a good portion of our activity was simply responding to requests from generally small companies with good ideas to say, we'd like to do something. You know, I have a terminal device. 
which is something AT&T doesn't produce. And I'd like to sell it so people can attach it to the network and have a service. Well, that's illegal. Sorry. Uh, the question of uh, access to the network. Computing industry in the old days says, so, you know, the age of standalone data processing is finished. If we can't get on the telecommunication system, we don't really have much of a future. Of course, AT&T then said, uh, oh, you couldn't do that. If you connected an IBM computer to the telecommunication system, the, no one would be able to communicate. The whole thing would just collapse. So you can say those policy debates that I was involved in were quite fundamental in opening up the network. We were simply providing access. And interestingly, we didn't view this as an ide ideological issue, uh, the way the Reagan administration took it over as. It was simply a matter that people had ideas, people had services, equipment they wanted to be able to use. And the question was, what are the benefits to costs for society, and is there a case <coughs> for denying them? In fact, you could summarize the whole competitive era, in a sense, uh, of that time, as simply shifting the burden of proof before the FCC from any applicant who wanted to enter the market, simply shifting it to AT&T. Originally, an applicant had to prove that if it entered the market, it would do no harm to anyone, including AT&T's profits. That was impossible. So nothing was approved. We simply changed the burden of proof and said, OK, AT&T, we're going to let these people do whatever they want to do unless you present evidence that there will be harm to the public interest. And they couldn't do that either. So the whole question there was a, highly related to a shift in the burden of proof. With regard to policy and regulation and internet development, of course, that required a change in FCC policies to allow others to provide services over the telecommunications system without being a telephone company. Here I put on one chart. <coughs> what I see as the major eras of change. Initially, we can say the question was the reform of the telecommunication facilities network. It used to be a monopoly. And as others were allowed to enter the market, the, the technology came mostly from computing and telecommunication equipment manufacturing, and uh, we could include electronics here, to change the structure and capacity of the telecommunication network in the provision of electronic services. So the first stage was really a reform. It was called telecom reform, a reform of the telecom sector to allow the participation of others. Then as that proceeded, we began to see the increasing incursions into telecommunication from other industries, and in particularly electronics, computing, uh, hardware, and software, and closer relation to the content industries. So that, then the terminology changed. It wasn't telecom reform anymore. It was the ICT sector, namely what used to be distinct industries now had converged. They were competing with one another. And what the ITC sector then provided was, one, all forms of content with the digital network that by now had been introduced to be provided over the network. And then secondly, all kinds of changes in the nature of the interactivity possible, you might say, which has now reached, I hope, its ultimate extreme with Twitter. <laughs> so the second phase was the ICT sector. And as economists studied the impact of the ICT sector, where it was argued for years, this is going to revolutionize the economy. It will improve the productivity of the entire economy. But every time the productivity economists did their studies, they said, well, this is improving the productivity of the ICT sector. But we see no evidence of improving the productivity of anything else. So the ICT sector was, was very productive in reproducing itself and becoming more and more significant in the economy, but the impact on other sectors was not very great, with one exception, the banking and finance sector. Why was banking and finance first? 
Well, one reason was simple forecasts of the amount of paper they would need to deal with the exponential increasing number of transactions suggested that we don't have enough trees in the world to do this all on a paper-based system, so you had better get an electronic system for providing those services. So if you look at all the different sectors in the economy, you'll basically find that it's been banking and finance that has taken the lead. And just think about the effects on, maybe, maybe some of you are too young, but the effects on my life uh, with regard to um, the implications. I haven't been in a bank in a long time. Uh, and uh, when you look at, you know, you can buy and sell stocks on your PC, you can buy and sell goods on your PC, but the financial sector is quite a bit ahead of the others. But you, well, we're so, now just beginning to get seriously into what I call the applications, the third, third stage of development here. The applications of the ICT benefits in all the different sectors, and we're beginning to get some serious research as to how ICT applications will fundamentally change firms and industries in those sectors. Key principle of reform, essentially network unbundling. Right? We are simply removing the old regulations, allowing an unbundling of the network to allow access at different levels. Uh, and this has included the industry sectors, equipment operator networks and services, as I've discussed. Fixed and mobile, you might say mobile was considered a revolution at the time because somebody other than the incumbent phone company was given a license. And you can imagine what would have happened to the mobile industry if the incumbent phone companies of the world had been able to keep the monopoly on mobile phones. Uh, and unbundling the vertical structure of telecom networks, markets, markets licensing, and regulation. This is, is particularly important because in the old era, licenses were very specific and narrowly defined. So firms would have a license to provide voice services over the fixed network. You would have a license to provide mobile services over a mobile network. You would have a license to provide data services. You would have a license to provide satellite services. Quite specific, vertically vertical licenses. That is, the license included the technologies and the services. Early in my career, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania with Larry, and after I had left the FCC, uh, I did some work with some venture capitalists who were very interested in developing a digital data network for the United States. All right, this was, this was the uh, early, mid-1970s. And this digital data network would be alongside AT&T's voice network. Uh, unfortunately, given what the power structure of the day, as you might happen, as you might expect, uh, the digital data network people had a wonderful idea, uh, but they were kept so busy before the FCC with appeals by AT&T and in the courts that after about five or six years of, uh, of spending all their money on lawyers and court cases, uh, they decided they would not go ahead with that idea. But that was the era of the vertical relation. We have now come to recognize that it's horizontal markets that are now developing. You see, unbundling of the network we now have horizontal markets. I've listed the four main categories. Uh, for some of your research, you may well be going into subcategories of this. But basically, the infrastructure providing the capacity, uh, the network management providing the capabilities for providing services, the services themselves providing some, some value added over the capability, and then the provision of content. And this process is still going on. One of the reasons I am I'm working with developing countries is when you look at the changes taking place, they're going at different speeds. So a lot of countries haven't made it here yet, or are still struggling with these policy issues. And we might say even in the US, the debates are still going on. That is, what is there going to be, what are the opportunities for the infrastructure operators in the US 
which are now accumulating significant market power to participate in and restrict the activities uh, at other levels. So this has become the new debate. Right? The old debate was over the vertical silos. This is over what happens on the horizontal silos uh, and horizontal market de developments. But what is particularly interesting here is whereas if you look at layer one, you know, this is fiber optics and, and based on other infrastructure, these decisions are still fairly clearly made at the national level and are self-contained. When you get into network management, this begins to go beyond the national level because the networks go beyond national level. The services go even broader and the, and, and the content is even, information services is, are, are really global. So what this is doing is it's calling into question then the significance of national policy. So the new policy and regulation, as I will be arguing in a few slides, uh, is essentially has to be done on a multilateral or global basis uh, because the, the, the national boundary line means less and less. So the significance of now what we see is network bundling at the horizontal level, particularly in regard to content diversity and variety of applications, uh, different kinds of service bundling, and then a growth in what I would call the protocol and management level with concerns about security, privacy, uh, quality, and the openness of ac access there. So then we say, all right, for the information infrastructure, the investment priorities for the 21st century internet economy, <coughs> And I think we summarize as follows. Local network, broadband access, right? That's, that's the, big, the big story in many countries. Get the broadband out there. And uh, Japan and South Korea are way ahead of the rest of us. Uh, you can get 50 or 100 megabits to the home, to which I suppose most of us would respond. <laughs> what will we do with 50 or 100 megabits to the home? Well, you could download a lot of movies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But for most of it, it's probably more than we really need. Universal access to the next generation network and its increased capabilities for providing a whole variety of services. Uh, and in the internet, in particular, local services. In my work in developing countries, many of them have no local services. The only thing that's available is what they can pull off to produce primarily in the US. And of course, mobile network extensions and cap capabilities. Interestingly, the big change, those of you that work in development, I hope one of the documents you are forced to read is the Maitland Report from 1984, which observed then that more than half the world's population had never made a phone call and had no access to the phone. Then the uh, popular world population was about 4 million and about more than 2 million that, that simply didn't have access. Since then, we've seen a revolution with the cell phone. And the cell phone has doubled the penetration in developing countries. So it's no longer two, 2 million connected, it's 4 million connected. So we can say, how much progress have we made? How many people are on, how many people now have never made a phone call or don't have access to the phone? About 2 million. Same as 1984, because we've got population growth. Uh, so now the challenge is, how do you reach them? And it's pretty much concluded that given the fact that they're very poor, this is going to have to be through mobile links. And even mobile links may be too expensive the way we're doing it now. So we need, need new technological developments. We need new business models. And we need new policies and regulations specifically directed to them. And then finally, applications. We're now beginning to get seriously into applications beyond banking and finance. The new developments, this is simply for reference, some of the major developments. Uh, cloud computing is uh, certainly one that has a lot of people thinking seriously about how its effect is going to be. And the, uh, the network of things. We no longer have to be dependent on people to do the communicating. Uh, we can have all of our devices and machines uh, 
communicating with one another on our behalf. Uh, well, what this is leading to a redesign of all production, administration, communication, transaction processes uh, throughout the whole economy. And that then is changing the foundation for restructuring most institutions in society. <coughs> a fundamental change in the communication underpinning of not only the economy, but of society. And so we're beginning to see a shift in the policy priorities. And I'd say a shift does not mean the replacement of one for the other. It's a recognition that the new things exist, and they have been often ignored before. A shift from the supply of network capabilities to the stimulation of demand for new <coughs> services and applications. From physical capital to human capital, namely if the people don't have the skills, capabilities, the awareness, development is not taking place, and diverse sources of private and public investment uh, at, all, at all levels. What we're seeing is what used to be considered private sector only investment now is involving public sector investment at a number of levels. A number of cities throughout the world are putting their own fiber optic links because they are fearful that unless they have a first-rate modern telecommunication network, they're not going to be able to attract business or hold business. Uh, the other end, increasingly universal service access is being developed by not from the top down, but from the bottom up by local co-ops engaged with uh, a lot of local activity, often free labor, uh, with assistance being provided in terms of training and related activities. And interestingly, in the US, this goes back to the history of how telephone service was obtained. Telephone service in the United States was obtained by 40 or 50,000 local co-ops, uh, not by at and That has meant there's a shifting loci for policy decisions. And what I've highlighted here is the nature of the shifts from national to regional and global. What used to be is pretty much national and self-contained with some negotiation. That's a good indicator. When I was at the FCC in about 1968. The dark ages. Hmm? The dark ages. Well, dark well that was dark. It was dark when we arrived. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> The simple categorization of, of AT&T revenues and information was interstate and foreign. There was no separate classification for foreign communication. It was so small relative to the total but um, not worth paying much attention to. So, you know, I mean, if Jonathan Aronson, Aronson, had, Aronson had tried to change the system, then he wouldn't have been successful. Right. He had to wait until it grew big, and there was a lot of inefficiency to be fixed there. Uh, and what that means, of course, is when you go from the national to the regional and the global, the whole nature of the negotiations change. You move very much into international relations in a whole variety of ways. Uh, it's shifting from industry-specific to a sectoral focus. Uh, industry-specific regulation works very well when you know the boundaries of the industry. If you don't know the boundaries of the industry, it makes it quite difficult to determine what is it you're regulating and why. From distinct economic, social, and cultural policies to converged policies. We used to have our so-called cultural policies in all countries. That's broadcasting. That's the mass media. That's the arts. That's all that stuff over there. It's simply a matter of finding the money and letting them do it. Now it's on the net. And now when you are making policies, how do you separate these different areas? Your economic policy has very powerful social and cultural implications, and vice versa. And it's shifting from national industry-specific regulators to diversified administrative authorities, legal regimes, and courts. If you look at the history of regulation in the United States, it began with state legislators. State legislatures were determining the price of electricity right, and the price of all kinds of public utilities. 
until it was realized they had no idea what a reasonable price was. And they didn't have the time to go through the necessary analysis details to know, and it was time consuming, expensive, arbitrary, and had negative consequences. So the administrative authority, the regulatory authority, was established in the states and then with the federal, federal government. So we had a Federal Communications Commission, a Federal Power Commission, all these individual commissions. This is to provide informed policy and regula regulation on an efficient basis to underpin the industry's development. Well, what happens then in the new arena? We see, well, they're only part of the picture now. Increasingly, competition authorities are coming into the board uh, because issues of competition are, are arising in very different ways than they did before. Uh, and what about the administration uh, on the internet? You know, what about ICANN? Uh, a significant regulator just quietly going about his little business. And other countries are saying, what is this body? Right? It's determining how the next stage development of the internet, which is fundamentally affecting our country, and it's run by a bunch of Americans whose authority we're very unsure. They have authority, and if they do, we have no say about it. So what's going to happen here? And of course, then the UN says, well, let's form a committee. Should we have this create a new, new UN organization? And people say, well, we already have one, the ITU. And then everyone groans. They say the ITU is one of the more inefficient organizations on Earth. <laughs> so this is not a good way to do it. It's, uh, things are a bit uncertain. Anyone have any good ideas? Uh, hopefully someone comes up with some <laughs> before too long. Um, and of course, increasingly, under different legal regimes, issues are being settled in the courts. And as you know, settling issues in the courts is a very efficient way to solve problems. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 still hasn't been solved. Right? There are still court cases going on related to that. So the whole idea of, of the administrative regulator is to provide an efficient system of regulation. And, and what we're seeing is the diversification is creating an environment where the structure of regulation provides options if you don't like the regulation. Not only countries, but is it courts, is it regulator? And then you say, well, if everyone who's unhappy about the policy of regulatory development can go follow any one of these avenues to slow it down, to stop it, to try and change it, then you end up in legal gridlock. I was disappointed to learn in talking to colleagues in Washington that the Washington Bar, that is the legal community in telecommunications, which when I was in Washington used to hold its annual conference in a small hotel, now cannot hold its annual conference in Washington anymore because there is no venue big enough to accommodate the number of people. Uh, so the growth industry here has been long. However, those of you that are planning on going to telecommunication law, I should alert you that many of us are trying to change that. So we hope that there will be no future in telecommunication <laughs> law. Okay, unresolved issues at the interface of the and technology. We should leave a little time for questions. Almost there. But yeah. uh, the interface of technologies, markets, and policies. And given the time and the warning I just got, I will race through these and leave it to you <laughs> to raise questions on what you're interested in. All right, public network infrastructure, questions of rights of way, spectrum, numbers, names, all of these things require underpinnings in policy and regulation. And if you think them through, they're all in a different location. Access and inter interconnection, still a fundamental issue. Uh, heard a, a presentation by uh, an experienced regulator the other day who's been around since the beginning. He said there are three important issues in telecom regulation. Interconnection, interconnection, and interconnection. Uh, leverage opportunities for monopoly nodes in the network. Mobile termination prices being the most obvious. 
trade issues, increasing interdependence, complexity, and the diversity of the benefits. I just participated in a conference, Jonathan, has had uh, over the last few days addressing some of these issues. Uh, standards balance, patents, hardware, software, services, and application. For a course we were doing in Denmark, uh, uh, I uh, checking the website of Nokia, which I thought was primarily a company dealing in technology and markets, and they had four high-profile jobs they advertised on their homepage. And one was a patent lawyer, and one was a patent engineer. So you figure, all right, 50% of the key new jobs at the top of the company are looking for are, are relating to law, relating to the patents. More and more patent battles are just part of the game. Uh, same with intellectual property rights. You know, I'm sure you know all about that. Uh, intellectual property rights in the United States is running wild. Uh, and uh, in fact, I may not even own the intellectual property rights to this presentation. Uh, digital contracts, uh, major serious issue raising legal security enforcement questions, competition law, uh, and uh, not only competition law as it relates to network industries, but our concepts of what is competition, what is effective competition, what isn't, uh, have to be revisited in this new environment. And then, of course, the intersection of applications, industry regulations. What happens when the telecom industry regulations are inconsistent with the banking industry regulations? Uh, and the recognition, employment, and training during the transition. And in particular, from a macro point of view, increasing evidence on the current collapse is that we may have a jobless recovery. The uh, gross national product starting to go up, uh, and the revenues of companies are starting to look good, and unemployment's still going up. So there is a serious question of not only unemployment, but then the adjustment of the changing skills base. And then finally, developing country inclusion. Do we include them as resources to be exploited, as markets to be exploited or developed, or as partners in the development? Those, I think, provide a pretty good research agenda. <laughs> so, you know, I probably won't be back before you're finished, but I will look forward to your publications in the future. Thank you. We have about 10, 15 minutes for questions, and I, the floor is open, and Jackie, you get the first question. So I was wondering how you keep these debates on jurisdiction and global standards multilateral, because it seems as though a lot of ICT regimes have been decided in bilateral trade, and in that sphere, developing countries don't really get a fair shake, and then you can't really use the Doha round anymore because the government yeah. you know, has collapsed in that one. So well, then what do you do? Well, that shouldn't be so bad because they never have got a fair shake. <laughs> so the question is, is the unfair shake now better than the old unfair shake? Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think here the uh, you, you put your finger on the nature of, of these developments. It affects not only ICT but all other areas as well. And perhaps a key factor is perhaps a major implication affecting the ICT sector is what's going on in agriculture. Now you say, what stopped the Doha right? There was disagreement on agriculture. And, and if most people that I know, if they look at the debate, says basically the United States and Japan and Europe have got to yield on agriculture. You cannot have subsidies and tariffs and protection mechanisms and, then, and just say, we'd like to sweep agriculture off the table. Let's talk about ICT services where we want to get in your countries. So, so the whole nature of the negotiating process, I, I, I think, has got to be thought through, and I'm, what I'm hoping is that basically two things will happen. One is the rich countries will realize it's actually in their interest to give in on these things. Uh, and, and then the, the developing country level, they need to get together so they have a common position. Uh, because what you find is different countries have their primary economic resource is something different. So they tend to be arguing from different positions. So it's not only the rich versus the poor. The poor are so diversified and unskilled. So, and they have not done a good job at, at 
bringing their common interests together. They sound like Democrats. So, huh? <laughs> they sound like yeah. Democrats. Yeah. So, so, you know, that, that will, I, I think that will help. The bilaterals that we're seeing, I think that it's not all bad. I mean, generally, it's seen as bad, right? If you're successful in bilaterals, you're, not, you're less interested in the global. But the bilaterals very quickly lead to regionals. So, you know, and if you look at Asia, right, where the bilaterals have, have gone way up over the, the last few years, uh, the, bi the bilaterals have extended to ASEAN-wide agreements, and that's bringing in some of the poorer countries. So I come back to my first statement, right? Uh, I, there are opportunities for improving the condition to have themselves in what you might call an equal partner shared negotiating arrangement is a long way out. But we can improve it. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, you mentioned that there's always been this horizontal levels on a global on a, on a global scale, but then the different example you gave, be internal governance, which is not multilaterally managed, and then the other one is the standards, which are obviously not multilaterally managed. I mean, in, in, in analog television, we had three global standards, and now come digital television, again, we have three global standards. We have US standards, and the five countries, the US kind of like forced to take the standard, then we have the Japanese and the Brazil standard, and well, maybe the only thing I could see is that what Europe is doing how the rest of the world is going through Etsy, through this, uh, this open communication forum. Do you see kind of opportunity that this European effort of sitting everybody on a table and deciding on standards will become global, or how is the US seeing that? I doubt it. Well, it's not going to become global anytime soon, but I think there will, it will be moving in that direction. The, the driving force here, I think, is going to be the costs, the escalating costs of leaving things the way they are. Right? I mean, I've, I've looked at Nokia. Nokia and Qualcomm have spent <laughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars suing one another in court for Right? So you, you say, when this becomes a, the mode of trying to resolve these disagreements, now eventually they do reach a point and say, actually, you know, we better start searching for a better way. So I think the failures at this level are what, what is going to force you know, the, the costs of status quo just get higher and higher and higher, and then eventually the major players have to begin to change. Um, look at um, uh, taking almost any regulatory uh, authority. I mean, look at ICANN. ICANN is now growing. We're waiting for the ICANN report. The ICANN has been basically constipated for the last little while on, on simple things. And you say, well, what is the future of ICANN? And the other thing too, that I think is does, everybody, is does everybody know what ICANN is? No. 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 Come, Come on. on. No. No. You probably should. ICANN is the group, which is actually a, uh, USC is their landlord. They're down in Marina del Rey, and they handle the names and numbering for of all of domain names and good things like that. So that they're the backbone regulator of uh, a lot of what happens on the internet. Uh, we, we used to run it, but we sort of got rid of most of it when one guy died. We had one guy on USC faculty who largely ran the internet for a long time. <coughs> um, <laughs> but you know, he died and it all fell apart. Uh, that's really only a slight exaggeration. So I, I think if, if you look at, at other, you might say other comparable things, <coughs> developments with regard to the law of the uh, other things that were seen as intractable problems. When did the countries move? Really, a, as the the potential gets greater and greater. In this case, as as, as usage and demand and revenues uh, continue to grow and spread, then the parties who are 
losing from this, then begin to search for an alternative way. You say right now that there's a limitation, that is, they haven't they haven't come over to, to looking for a better way, and and I you know it's not it's not going to be a, a big change. It's going to be a small movement in the right direction. <coughs> I believe that it affects much of my work. Is the key part of it is empowering developed developing countries, and and they can be empowered because they are very inefficient. Right? They have their own internal problems. They are not very good at representing their own best interests. They're not very good at cooperating with their own colleagues. Uh, so there's a real learning curve they have to get on. Uh, and that's where I think academics in particular have a major contribution into helping train and work with people in developing countries who will either go into these kinds of jobs or be advisors to them or training people. So getting programs like the Edinburgh School of Communication established in the in, in some developing countries, much smaller model of course, but to get it going I think is part of that particular process. Uh, but yeah, on, on the standard, of course in economics there's, not, there's always a debate about, about if, if you have too much control over standardization then you restrict innovation and technology. Well, uh, but you know, what I expect is that since in mobile Europe dominated 2G and Asia 3G, you know, presumably the Americans should get their act together. <laughs> but if you want to be in the game in 4G, then you should change your way of doing this. Chris, yeah. well, I was just going to say, thinking about this notion of um, when will a threshold of cost be reached such that it in inspires people to change, you use the financial regime as sort of like your way into this talk. There you had an entire sector worldwide literally almost collapse and is rapidly looking to do exactly what they were doing before, <laughs> even to a, to a higher degree in terms of super fast computing, used to do even larger volumes of rapid trading, um, even more obfuscated from regulatory oversight than ever before. So, I mean, here we are literally backing up from the precipice of a full-blown global collapse, and people rapidly just want to keep doing what they had been doing that led them there. So, I mean, it, it's pretty, it makes you wonder, will people internalize this sense of danger or inefficiency, if not danger, at least inefficiency in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a scenario where they might want to do a rethink of business as usual. Well, I think it depends who the people are. You know, as, as, as people in industry say, you know, don't look at us. We're not bad guys. We're, we're in, in capitalism. Our goal is to invent new markets and make a lot of money out of it. So if you want to restrict what we do, that's a law. You know, Reagan administration, withdrew these laws that had been established in the 1930s that forced the separation from investment banking from normal banking, and they, now they didn't have to do that. So you say, you know, they say, and when you, when you stop and think about it, that, that, yeah, you can say, all right, you're just an uneth unethical bastard. But why, why, from the standpoint of workers in the, in the field, right, they have a job, they're being told to do something, it's legal, uh, so the question is, do the policymakers and regulators uh, recognize that this is going to happen again unless we establish some informed, sound regulations that prevent these people from doing this? Uh, but I think that, that's the real concern. The Obama administration doesn't reestablish the regulations of the 30s. They don't have to do anything new. Uh, same thing's going to happen again for some. <coughs> One more question. Uh, question for you on uh, advocacy, which you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and as you're talking about the shift from uh, national policy to both regional and global, um, I'm wondering a little about this uh, Creative Commons, which doesn't seem like a traditional policy structure, but more like a movement. Yeah. Um, and as you think about the role of advocacy and shifting from kind of national formal structures, what's the role of less formal structures in policy? Is that something you see changing? Well, yeah, things like common commons, common movements, have a lot of influence over policy. Uh, 
Well, in the old days, we used to call these uh, public interest groups, <laughs> consumer groups, and you would have advocates. Uh, well, I used to work with, uh, uh, oh, I forget the name of it. It was essentially a group for, for old and disabled people. Uh, basically, the telecommunications system didn't serve them. Uh, people who spoke different languages. Uh, that go back to my era, right? pick up the local telephone book. It was in English. <laughs> that was it. So the, 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 there's all kinds of, I think, common advocacy in the system. And I think those kinds of, in many cases, grassroots activities can have significant influence. Uh, what, what do they need to have influence? Uh, the most thing they need is a solid research foundation for what they say. Because a lot of them say things that are nonsense. Uh, they, and they be able, need to present it well. Uh, and of course, the stronger the, the group and the mission they have, the more influence they will have. And I think when you look at all of, all of that going on with regard to net activities, uh, that, that has an influence. The other thing is, is when you're pushing public interest advocacy, look for some of the rotten bastards out there in industry who agree with you on this issue. Right? When we were trying to get the telecommunication system opened up, we knew we had all the economic arguments, we had the research evidence, and we knew there was a snowball's chance in hell we would ever convince the commissioners to change anything. So what did we do? We said, computing industry will support this. Right? They want access to the network. Anyone who's manufacturing anything other than AT&T and telecommunication will support this. This is a bigger market for them. So we went out and recruited them and said, well, you get your lawyers to file with the FCC demanding change. Right? So they did, and we got the FCC to put out a notice of inquiry. Should we change our policy? All of a sudden, we had 10,000 petitions saying yes. So then they had to listen. They had to look at the evidence. So I think, you know, you have to play the same strategic game they play in terms of the advocacy of the... I want to thank Bill, but first I want to make uh, a couple of quick announcements. One is Bill's been around for uh, much of this week. So one, if you are interested in grabbing some time with him, uh, you can come up afterwards and talk to him. And he can, that can be arranged. Second, he's going to be talking more about the development issue in detail Tomorrow at 4 o'clock at Kirkhoff, which is the outpost up on Adams, at 734 Adams, from about 4 to 6, so um, a broader extension. So if you're interested in the broader communications and development issues, uh, you are all invited to come attend that. And third, um, Bill's very shy, but he's promised that uh, at dinner with some students on Wednesday. He's going to tell people what he really thinks. <laughs> and if you would like to, uh, there's a couple spaces still open for that. You should talk to Jade, who is organizing that. Well, Nina, Nina but, Nina. right idea. What? Nina, but. Nina. <laughs> yeah. Why am I doing this? I, you're the new Jade. I'm the new Jade. But Nina, who, Nina O'Brien, who is doing this. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I do this. If I only, my, the only thing I can say is I never could remember names. It isn't all cyber. We'll let Jade that now, the next year. Jade's off in straight. Africa somewhere trying to help the world. Well, this time <laughs> next year, you'll be the new Nina. Well, okay, that's good. Um, so that if you'd like to uh, find the time to talk about ICTD uh, in the next few days, uh, Please grab some time. If you want to know Russia, these two are the good, good ones. And if you want to know the story about how the USC ran the internet, um, I'll tell it to you in other time. <laughs>